I want to, uh, let's just pray together really quick again. Father, I just thank you that you are such a gracious, loving God, that you care about each one of us, every need that we have, every detail in our lives. You see, you're watching, you are a part of, and you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. And that plan is for us to succeed, <laughs> to... Jesus came that we might have life and have life to the abundance, to the fullness. Our life would be full and abundant. And we just thank you for that. Thank you that you are a consistent, loving God. And I just say, Holy Spirit, (laughs) come. We want to turn this service over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to start this morning with a story. I have decided. So, are you ready to tolerate this one? (laughs) Well, I know back, I'm having to rely on a memory, something that took place 60 years ago. So, I'm telling you as I remember it. This may not be exact, but to the best of my memory, this is the way I remember it. We used to, we being my family, my mom, my dad, and at that time my brother, myself. I don't believe I yet had a little sister somewhere close in there. But used to go, my mom's family lived in predominantly around the Phoenix area, between Phoenix and Tucson, scattered out there through Arizona. So occasionally we would take a our Christmas vacation, a Christmas break for a couple of weeks, and we would drive down there where it was warm and sunny and enjoy a couple of weeks of just hanging out with, with her family, her, primarily her aunts, uncles, and cousins. And so one time we were there, and this, I was either eight or just about to turn nine, I believe, and <clears throat> I remember this well. My, my uncle, my aunt and uncle's house, a little house with in that area, and they were not wealthy people, all of the ground was just like sandy, dirt and sand in that, in that area because they just didn't have the money for them, the water and stuff for, to have grass. So I remember standing out in there with my uncles and my dad and my uncles, and we're standing out in a circle out close to the street, and they saw the little neighbor boy across the street, and they motioned to him, and, and, and I just have to say that I was always the tall skinny kid, I was all one of, always one of the two tallest kids in my class. There were roughly 200 kids in my, in my graduating class, for among, for, so for among those 200, I was typically usually in the top two for the tallest, which makes you seem like a big kid when you're tall, even if you're tall and skinny. So we got down there, and, 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 and one of my uncles was looking across the street, one of the kids over there, and he goes, hey, come over here. And this kid had boxing gloves. The tall, skinny kid, and the, uh, another culture, another ethnicity that typically has sh- shorter people in it, this kid was, and he came over and it's like, you guys are fairly close to the same size. You must be about the same age. It's like, Lynn, I want you to box this kid. And I was like, well, I'm taller than he is. I think this ought to be fun. This will be all right. So he has the boxing gloves, so we get hooked up and we get the boxing gloves put on and say, okay, and, and, and my dad says, <clears throat> protect yourself. It's like, protect myself. Okay. I've never done this before. I've never even seen boxing gloves up close, but protect myself. I'm ready to go. So we get these gloves on, me and this this kid that I'd never met before, but he was a little bit shorter than me. And I say that because, you know, as we mature in age, we can be way more, okay, let me get this worded right. Somebody two or three years older when you're eight, to nine years old can be a whole lot more mature and even coordinated. Right? Are you following me? So, I get out there and I'm relatively confident, a little bit nervous, and it's like, okay, go. So it's like, all right. I'm figuring out where am I going to hit this guy? 
where am I going to hit this guy? And while I'm still thinking, where am I going to hit this guy? Two really quick punches were thrown, neither of which were mine. <laughs> and I found myself, first time in my life, with a, a, a bright flash of light and a few little stars and wondering what just happened, staggering back and, you know, that, he knew what he was doing. Thank God he quit. <laughs> And I reached up, and, and I had this stabbing pain going up into my head, and I reached up with that glove just to touch my nose, and I saw blood. My first ever bloody nose. And I've not had very many after that, but I, I went into a, a, a battle completely unprepared and not knowing what in the world to expect. Here's the really, the really funny part of, of this whole thing. Well, my dad wasn't exactly sure what to do with the double blood he knows, so he's ushering me in to my redhead, fiery mother, who was not at all pleased with what had just happened to her son. Needless to say, there was a little bit of schooling that took place right there on my father's part. <laughs> it's like they didn't really ever fight in front of us kids, but she was so fired up right then that she couldn't quite hold it back in just how she felt about that. But I was just thinking about that. I, I was taken out. I looked good, had the gloves on. I thought I was ready to go to battle, but I was not even somewhat prepared or prepared for what was about to take place or for what might happen. I want to use that as an introduction into becoming battle ready. Battle ready. And the first place that, that, that I want to turn is to Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Getting prepared for a battle. Now for me, it was putting on these, these, these boxing gloves and stepping out there thinking I was somewhat confident, a little nervous, but fairly confident because I had sized up the enemy, I thought. <laughs> Only much to my dismay and chagrin, I was grossly mistaken. So we're going to read from Ephesians 6, beginning with the 10th verse, where it starts, Finally, <laughs> finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil your adversary, your enemy. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. The rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, everybody say therefore. therefore. It's always something important coming after a therefore in the Bible. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you might be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. I'm going to stop. I'm going to just break this down a little bit. And I've got a lot to say that I want to share this morning, so I'm going to be doing a little bit of hurrying here. But having your waist girded with the truth... If, you, if, you, if you're measuring, your waist is pretty much just about like the center of who you are, right? Where are you? So you measure that, that your waist would be girded with truth. So the center of my being would be girded, well-established, wrapped up in truth. And what is the truth? Jesus, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Knowing who we are, that Jesus is the truth. That's the center of our being, the truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, girded our waist in truth, having put on the breastplate. What's the breastplate? It's the thing that protects your, your breast, your chest right there. And what's heart? Having put on the breastplate to protect your heart, that breastplate of righteousness. So what is it that protects our heart? Righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. 
sinking. And I'm going to be talking a lot about, about protecting our heart this morning. And I think one of the things that is, is so important, and we're going to get into another scripture where it talks about guarding your heart, guarding your heart. That breastplate of righteousness, right living, understanding that Jesus is our righteousness, and that through him we are made righteous, girded with that truth around our waist, the center of our being, we become righteous beings in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yes, I like that. <laughs> Breastplate of righteousness to protect your heart. Having shod your feet, having put, <laughs> shooed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Preparation of the gospel of peace. Man, I meditated on that for quite a while. Having put, having shooed yourself with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I had a vision one time, a dream one time that I wrote down. I actually have this one written down and I just want to share just a snippet of that dream. I was standing at there. The worship was already starting in here and I was looking and there was no, no pastor. There was no pastor. I'm, I'm standing holding on to a a baby in a car seat, and there's no pastor here, and the music had started. The worship is beginning, and I'm standing there at the door holding this baby, and I look down, and I don't have any shoes on. It's like, oh, no. Do I run home and get shoes, or do I go in there and get this started? Because they're starting worship without me. And, uh, and then that's when, when I woke up, think, not realizing what that meant, that preparation having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I think, what is the gospel of peace? Jesus said when he was sending out, what I was talking about just last week, when he sent out the 70, being prepared with the gospel of peace. When you go into a house, if that house receives your peace, then stay in that house. If that house doesn't receive your peace, Kick the dust off your sandals and walk out. But take your peace with you. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So our ability to enter into, to walk, to live and work in His peace is that preparation of the gospel of peace. And that was good right there. <laughs> Preparation of the gospel of peace. Jesus said, my peace I give unto you, a peace that surpasses all understanding. And that's the peace where I want you to dwell and to work from. Everybody with me? Yes. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which... I mean, a shield, a shield of faith is something that, that we can direct that shield anywhere that we need to through faith. Shield of faith with which you were able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. How important is faith? Faith becoming our shield where our focus can be, where we can focus, we can quickly maneuver that shield wherever it needs to go as we focus in and through our faith. And take the helmet of salvation, something to protect your head, something that will protect your head. We also have, there's also a scripture that said, "In the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind." So that peace also is part of that salvation, that helmet of salvation in knowing that we're saved, knowing that we're a child of God, knowing that we're safe in Him. And confident in that knowledge is the helmet of salvation. I am saved. I am His. I am a glorious Son of the Most High. Understanding and knowing that, that helmet of salvation. And the sword of the Spirit, which is 
And the sword of the Spirit, which is? There's my sword. All right, so we've got that battle ready. Put on the full armor of God. I, this is something that I've referred to many, 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 many times in my life, thinking about and extremely spent some time meditating on it just this morning. Remember that. Ephesians 6. Now I want to tur- turn to Proverbs 4, 23 and 24. Keep your heart. Another translation says, guard your heart with all diligence. But what you say? Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Keep your heart. It's something that we have to intentionally think about, be proactive in what we allow into our heart and what we allow to stay in our heart. I'm going to skip to the next, move on quickly to the next one, which would be Matthew 12, 35 and 37. Keeping in mind, guard your heart, guard your heart, guard your heart. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasures, brings forth evil things. And what's the next? But I say to you that every idle word man may speak, they will give account of or account for in the day of judgment. It's not what goes in our mouth, it's what comes out of our mouth that defiles us, that we will give account for on the day of judgment. So why is it so important that we guard our heart? Well, because out of the heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Every word (laughs) that comes out of our mouth, you would certainly think, is coming from our heart, right? When you think about that, it's like, wow, wow, wow. Sometimes what in, in our, in this time that we live, there is such a, Oh, such a, a desire, something that is so funny, it seems, is that when we cut somebody else down, to, to, to cut, what's the word that I'm looking for? Sarcasm, sarcasm. Cynicism and sarcasm is, is just become a big part of our society and a big part of what we, what we think is funny is, is the words that come out, of our, come out of our mouth. But you know what? That's why we're to guard our heart because what comes out of our mouth is something that's in our heart. So it's a continual guarding, paying so close attention as to what we allow to go in and what we allow to stay there, what we allow to remain. It's certainly not impossible to cleanse and to get rid of. Clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands and a pure heart. We're going to talk about that here here just in a little bit. But when I think of guard your heart, it's like... (laughs) It's not too, not too far in the, in, the distant, in the distant past, fairly recently, there was something that I had realized. Um, scripture says, if your brother has ought against you, if your brother has ought against you, not if you have something against your brother, but if you know that your brother has ought against you, you need to take care of that and be reconciled to your brother. Otherwise, not only have you left something in their heart, in your brother's heart, but there's something in your heart as well that needs to be cleansed. Or in every conversation that you might have with him, her, or about him or her, there can be something that comes out with a barb in it, with a hook, something sarcastic, or even just a little bit nasty. 
because you have not cleansed your heart, you have not forgiven that person or have not asked that person to forgive you. Are you with me? That we have to guard our hearts above all things. Guard your heart. Be intentional with what is in your heart, what you allow to stay in your heart. Mm. Be justified or condemned by the words that come out of your mouth. And every idle word, every idle word that comes out of your mouth. I was thinking, I was having a talk with, uh, with Joy. We had, a, we had a, just a great meeting here this week where we got to cover a lot of ground. I mean, we made it probably three quarters of the way through the Bible in three hours the other day. But uh, talking about, you know, when, when truly you're going to change a culture, when you are really going to shift a culture, it really has to end up coming from our hearts, from our hearts that we, and the words that come out of our mouth. How valuable, how important the words that we, that we speak are, and that we need to be changing that culture among our children. That we need to be changing that culture among our children, that we're proactive in what words come out of our mouth when we're speaking about somebody that we're encouraging. You know, you go out in the world and there's plenty of that sarcasm and cynicism that... What we're called to do is to encourage one another, to edify, to build, to bring comfort into somebody's life. It's like, that's... Now that's what's going to change the culture is when all of us are... The things that I appreciate about Taylor is she's very rarely... Is she... In fact, I don't think I've ever heard her actually just come and say something negative about somebody. She's always just walking around being Miss Positive unless there's something in her life that's happening where she's looking for counsel or something. But she just walks around saying positive things about people. And I, I love and I appreciate that about you, Taylor. That's, that's a, a great trait that we all need to be looking at and we all need to be thinking about is, what is it that I can say that's going to encourage you? Looking into your life, what, what encourages you? Not what, not what I can say if there's three people around me that makes you feel stupid or look stupid. That is so, 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 so wrong. And when I sit in that judgment seat, I'm going to be looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of those words that I have used and done, idle words over my life that I thought was funny. Something to get a laugh. Are you with me? And that's guarding our heart. It's guarding what we're taking into our heart, keeping our heart clean, keeping our hearts pure. But when you have a hurt in your heart and that has you have allowed to stay in your heart and you have not not, not, not seen that healed, cleansed, and forgiving ta- forgive, forgiveness taken place one way or the other, then too many of the things that come out of your mouth will be from that place of hurt. Hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. So it's so important that we as the body of Christ have gone through the process to get this cleaned out. I finally forgave that kid that bloodied my nose. (laughs) And it did not require an inner healing session. Okay. I want to to, uh, move quickly to Psalms 11. Uh, Yeah, I think that's the whole Psalm 11. In the Lord, I put my trust. What is is battle preparation? Put my trust in the Lord. I become battle ready. I put on the full armor of God and the steps that I begin to take. I I have three big steps. The first one is guard your heart. Clear, clean, and pure. 
Guard your heart. Keep it clear, clean, and pure. Number one. Verse number one, in the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to the mountain? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this question. I, I am interpreting this psalm as if David is speaking to the Lord. In the Lord I put my trust, but Lord, how can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Or as the Lord would be saying, flee as a bird to my mountain. For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. Mm. That they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. Put on that shield, that breast shield of righteousness because the enemy is aiming at your heart. To put a hurt, to put an arrow, to put a barb in your heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Oh, that's a great question. We're looking at potential destruction of the foundation that our country was built on. It's like, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. He's watching. He's watching. He's watching, he's seeing, his eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. Mm. (laughs) The Lord tests the righteous. Who are the righteous? We're the righteous. The Lord tests the righteous. I remember, probably in the neighborhood of 10 years ago, preaching a message saying, when, 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 when you're in school, thinking about when you're in school, taking a test, the teacher's silent. <laughs> Just think about that one for a second. <laughs> when you're in school and it's test time and you're taking a test, most of the time the teacher is silent. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. It's like, oh, so God has a soul which has thoughts, feelings, and emotions, and he absolutely, his soul, he's a spirit being, so his spirit wants all to have salvation and to live, but his soul hates those who are wicked and violent. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire, and brimstone, and a burning wind. Thus shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance, like that, that his countenance would be on us. His countenance, we were, our desire is to see his face and for his countenance to shine on us. His countenance beholds the upright. That's something to cheer for right there. It's like, yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Your presence. Your presence. He loves righteousness because he is righteous and his countenance beholds the upright. Psalms 24. Psalms 24, verses 3 and 5. One of the things I want you to, to, maybe I hope that possibly you wrote down, to fly to his mountain. Fly to his mountain. Out of that scripture that it says, should I as a bird fly to your mountain? We go to Psalm, excuse me, 24, 3 and 5. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? You know, I've read this, I don't even know how many times, and I've quoted it probably 20 or 25 or 30 times. Like, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Only I never said into before. And as I've meditated and meditated on this passage in this scripture, who may ascend into? Everybody say with me, into. Into. Into the hill of the Lord. Or may stand in his holy place. 
He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Why is it that we need to protect our heart? Why is it that we need to guard our heart? Because to ascend into the hill of God, that place of rest, that place of peace, that place of safety, that place of comfort, we need clean hands and a pure heart. Yeah? Who has, who, he's describing those with clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol? And what is an idol in our life? You've heard me say this at least half a dozen times, quoting Jack Taylor. Anything that we have to ask first before we can say yes to God has become an idol in our life. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, like made a promise to God or to anybody else that you don't keep, that you didn't even intend to keep? Are you still with me? He, so I'm going to back up, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, made a promise that he has no intention of keeping, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. <clears throat> now that sounds like good stuff too. To ascend into the hill of God, into his holy temple, into the sacred place, into where there is safety, joy, peace, protection. Now Psalms, we're going to turn to... So <clears throat> I think... For your benefit, I'm going to take a drink of water. <clears throat> Psalm 27. <clears throat> I'm going to read verses one through uh, one through six and twenty-seven. <clears throat> The Lord is my light and my... Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? No one. The Lord is my light. He's my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? No one. When the wicked came against me to eat my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. When the enemy comes and they're encamped against me, my heart shall not fear. Everybody just say with me, fear not, fear not. for I am with you, says the Lord. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. My heart will not fear. One thing I've desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, we're not talking about after I die. He says, all the days of my life. And Second Peter talks about that, would be, that we would be granted entrance into that eternal life. Not talking about entrance later, we're talking about entrance now. All the days of my life, say all the days of my life, all the days of my life. that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Oh. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Well, that gave me just a little chill right there. It's like, wow. Set me high upon a rock. Who will ascend into the hill of God? Those with clean hands and a pure heart. The righteous, the righteous, the righteous. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. 
I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. I've heard <clears throat> in the last couple of days, I think I've heard about three, four, three or four people saying, you know, when I'm in the church and when we're worshiping, the pain is gone, the anxiety is gone, the, it, it's gone, it's gone. When I'm in that anointed place, it, it, it's gone, it leaves, it's gone. But I can get back home or I can get back to where, and, and it comes back again. It's like, oh, you know what? That's something that, we're, that, that we need to do, that we need to be in the place that we need to go, and that's the joy of the Lord. So that's, that's what we're doing. <clears throat> says <clears throat> 27 and 1 through 6 I will offer sacrifices of what? Joy. How do we offer a sacrifice of joy? How do we offer a sacrifice of joy? We get ourselves to a place of joy we bring that joy into the house of the Lord. If you don't have that joy when you come in the house of the Lord, you need to get it when you get here. You need to get yourself there. And you need to make that sacrifice in his tabernacle. Does this make sense now? Now, why do we feel the anointing in the presence of God when we come into, into the tabernacle, into his temple? It says because he inhabits the praises of his people. But you want to take that with you? Just stay in an attitude of praise and worship. A continual attitude of praise and worship. Giving him praise, giving him glory, giving him thanks. And then... We, sometimes it, 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 it's like, I don't just feel it. Let me read you the definition of, the definition of joy. Webster Dictionary, so uh, Merriam-Webster. The emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. Delight. <laughs> Let's process that here just for a second. Forget about the first three, four things there. Or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. The prospect of possessing what one desires, what do we call that? Faith, glistening hope, belief. Joy comes through believing. Is that not what the, the description right there? In the... We can have joy in our life just by believing. Seeing those things that are not as if they were, hoping, trusting, and believing that they are going to be, will bring joy into our lives. If we see it enough, if we think it enough, if we speak it enough from a clean heart, clean hands, pure heart, joy comes into our life, gratitude comes into our life, and that attracts angelic activity into our lives, and we will see it happen. The prospect, of the prospect of possessing what one desires, period, those two periods above each other, semi, no, delight, delight, delight. I want to, uh, last week I read from Luke, this week from, from Matthew, go with verse 20, uh, chapter 25, verses 21 and 23. Now this is after, you know, the, the, the master that was, that was leaving, the king that was leaving, and he, he left, 
uh, five talents with one, two talents with another, and this one it's five talents, two talents. When he came back and the one that had doubled the five talents, he said, the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. It's one of the things that, you know, God is testing the righteous. Well, he gives us something to do, something to accomplish, and then there's a test. You don't get to move on to the next level. Sometimes we think, I'm not hearing God. I am not hearing God. He's not speaking to me right now. Well, the last thing he told you, did you do it? Did you do the last thing that he gave you to do? Or did you think, oh, I need something a little more grandeur than that? It's like, oh, no, no. He who has been faithful in a little, we hear the voice of God. We hear the nudging of God. He gives us something to do. If we do it in obedience, here's what he's saying back. The Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Oh, enter into the joy of your Lord. uh, Another thought, what is the joy of our Lord? Enter into his joy? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He is our belt, that belt that is the center of who we are. For the joy set before him endured the cross, that joy that he would overcome death, hell, and the grave, that he would become our salvation and our righteousness, that he would see all of, all of creation given the opportunity through his sacrifice to be saved. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. We can enter into his joy through our obedience. And he that received two talents, the Lord, you delivered me two. I gained two more talents, so I doubled what you gave me. The Lord said to him, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few, and I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I'll just say this morning that through our obedience, through our sacrifice of joy that we bring into the house of the Lord together, we receive his blessing. We receive his blessings over and over and over and over. We enter into his joy and we enter into his rest.